Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I, I've, I'm always impressed with Australian politeness. Um, so um, my name is Ed Snodgrass. I'm from the U.S. I own a, um, a green roof nursery in the U.S. So all we do is supply plants for green roofs. And we've been in business about 12 years now. So um, I thought I would do a talk on maintenance. It's not going to be the prettiest talk you'll see today. It's going to have things that are uh, that need to be fixed and, and undone. But I think if I would look back 12 years and say, what could we, how could we have improved in America? And that would be connecting design with maintenance from the beginning. So that's kind of the theme of the talk. Um, here's my, uh, my nursery from uh, one of my neighbors actually just fixed, a, fixed up a 1941 biplane. So we talked him into a little flyby. And um, we supply uh, we've been averaging about uh, 100,000 square meters a year of, of green roof and uh, through our pipeline. So we do plant production and horticultural consulting. So that's kind of what what the nursery looks like. We run on um, we try to run on what we call current solar income. So uh, we do all our heating with um, spent vegetable oil. We pump all our water with solar. We have composting toilets, living wages, those kind of things. So we try to make a, we try to kind of live our values as well as uh, just supply plants. So, I mean, we could use more napalm, but we really can't afford it. So I think the the first thing to think about when you're thinking about green roofs is what were cities like before they were cities, and um, I think that most cities were some sort of mature ecosystem that was providing services for that area, that was cleaning water and cleaning air and recharging groundwater and doing all these things. And this is a, a slide from my friend Tom Lipton in Portland, just showing what's gone on in Portland. Every, every city will have some sort of version of this, but you can see that we go from infiltrating groundwater and having have these high-functioning ecosystems to pretty much scarified landscapes uh, that are highly impervious, uh, highly impervious, don't recharge groundwater, reflect heat. And so if you look at a city from the air, the, the biggest opportunity to uh, replant or revegetate cities is on roofs and walls. Sidewalks and highways and those kind of things are, are really much more difficult. So with that, the question is how can we do this in a way that, that gets us our services at scale that also are affordable for cities' budgets, and especially in, as uh, economies kind of rise and fall. So first we tried um, using old cars and trees and border collies and trench coats to fix stormwater problems, but that didn't really work. And so the, um, uh, the wise people in cities thought, well, we'll just use signs. That'll help. Um, so we put signs up, but that really didn't clean water. Just keeping people away from water is not the same as cleaning it. Um, and then we found out that stormwater actually killed the dinosaurs. You can see there's proof of that. Um, so what, what happens to cities with all this eventually, this is in, uh, in northern China just a couple weeks ago uh, out of hotel room windows. So this is really what we've done to those kind of mature ecosystems. It's, it's really kind of this very post-apocalyptic look that, that we can see. And, um, but there are... There are ways to fix this at scale, and I think Stuttgart um, has done that. If you see the same, the same kind of view over a city landscape, you can look at Stuttgart. And this is 40 years of work. So you, know, you have to keep encouraged that, that you can do this. Now, those aren't the most biodiverse, beautiful green roofs. But at scale, they are doing, they are doing the service that they're designed to do. And so I think one of the other things is as you, as you layer up these different services, you have different design criteria and different maintenance criteria. So some myths about green roof maintenance. Largely, it's not like maintaining turf. Um, it's, not, it's not for grazing, generally. Um, you, can't do, you can't just put it up and do nothing. Um, and there's no special machine that comes in and, and does green roof maintenance. So th these things are all, I think, in the sales process, sometimes green roofs get really misunderstood. We have to work with designers. They're very hip and modern, and you'll hear from them later. Um, and, and green roofs at, um, have gotten a lot of notoriety and fame at garden shows. This is at Chelsea, and this is uh, University of Sheffield's. 
uh, kind of bio garden at Chelsea with their green roofs and they're cleaning stormwater and doing all this, um, providing habitat in these walls, using shipping containers. And this is really amazing and, uh, and it become really popular. There's the, there's the queen and her bodyguard in pink there talking to Dr. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Nigel Dunnett. Uh, at Chelsea. So they, they become really the hot thing in a lot of places and uh, the Queen only visited four gardens at Chelsea and Sheffield's was one. So it was, it was kind of a big deal. Nigel didn't know whether he was going to shake hands or not so he had his hands neatly tucked behind his back um, just in case someone made a move on him. So I think one, one way to think about maintenance is to think about, well, what are we trying to provide here? And I think oftentimes in, in green roof presentations I see and in green roof salesmanship um, they lump all these together like they're going to happen magically and it's really a function of design and, and picking an intent and, and also prioritizing hierarchically which one do you want to favor, which one do you want to emphasize and then how do you kind of move that through the life of the roof. We tend to think on our projects which are largely extensive green roofs that we're building plant pallets for 20 to 50 year lives. That's kind of our um, you know, my normal. when I was just in China, they said, our roofs last about five years. So you, know, you, you, you have to like adapt when you go to a different country. And they said, well, they tend to leak right away and we replace them every five years. So that, you know, you have to readjust the plant choices accordingly there. And some of the, some of the, the work lately in design has been, well, how are we connecting these roofs to the ground landscape? So can we, can we have relationships between at-grade planting and rooftop planting and what does that look like? Uh, can we move the plants in the larval stage from the trees to the adult stage in Lepidoptera, for example, up to the roof? Can we create water environments on the roofs? So as you do all these different things, you change the maintenance protocols to keep those um, vibrant and alive. Things tend to get less biodiverse by nature, so if you want to keep things uh, fresh and alive, you've got to work on that. So the other thing is that with the advent of CAD, that everything looks good in design. And um, this is the Four Seasons in, in Boston, the Four Seasons Hotel that we did. And the, the roof is really beautiful, but the owner wanted to know why it didn't look like the CAD drawing. Because plants don't exist that look like that. They can't, they can't quite uh, get that. So there, first there's kind of a, a, a level setting that goes on inside um, the design community to say, well, this, this is a representation. Um, so I'm going to start from the bottom up. Um, I think a lot of things that happen when green roof maintenance is you've got to, you've got to do this blend of professions between um, roofing and landscaping and horticulture and drainage and, and heating and air conditioning and all these things that are going on at once. And so if, if you want to be into green roof maintenance, you have to have some sort of basic understanding, uh, enough even to say, well, this is not where I should be or this is where I should be. A lot of stuff is around what happens if you get a leak and how do you find it. And this is a, a project we worked on. This is 26 acres of green roof at the Howard Hughes Medical Center in Northern Virginia. And so it's above a big parking area and um, what we call groundhogs. They're kind of like a small wombat for us. They dug down and, and tried to burrow through the roof and, and penetrated the, uh, that, uh, I guess, a, um, some sort of TPO or PVC uh, waterproofing there. And so they peeled it back and fixed it. You know, it wasn't like a huge deal. But you see, here's, here's all the layers going back and people fixing it. Um, so these things do happen. They don't happen to, green roofs really don't leak as much as regular roofs because they're protected membranes. But uh, it's not the end of the world. Here on a smaller job, um, one of the things I think if, if you can coordinate with these kind of repairs is that if you can get in advance of the roofing people, you can put some things like this along and have them not just trudge all over the roof. You can direct them. So you do something like this and just put them in temporarily and you'll save yourself a lot of horticultural work later so that it, it doesn't... Um, and if there's going to be a regular regular maintenance, like this is a cell tower or something, then you can put in temporary pavers or stepping stones because otherwise they're just going to roam all over the place and they're going to, it's going to become an ashtray and a dumping ground. And so the more you make traffic directed, even temporarily, uh, it, it's a real benefit. Um, 
The other solution is you can do this from the beginning with um, uh, aluminum grates. They tend to be better than steel because they don't transmit as much heat to the to the plants or plastic. But they you can build these and sit on little pedestals, and the plants can come right on through. So that's kind of nice. Um, and pavers. The question is on some of these. Um, uh, this is on Dansko shoes in the U.S. And there was a question where these uh, these plants that were designed to go on the green roof are growing between the pavers. Are they a weed or not a weed? And so that's a discussion with the client. Um, I suggest that they pull every one of the every other one of the pavers out, just uh, let them go. But uh, so these are nested right in green roof media, so water is running underneath. So you know you, these are the kind of things if you're going to be into maintenance that you need to define this stuff because you don't want to have no budget for that, and then the client says, well, I want that weeded, and now you're down there with tweezers picking things out between pavers. The other thing is uh, uh, heating and air conditioning. Uh, a lot of the air conditioning in the U.S., that they it pulls humidity out of the air, so you have things like this. And so now you have a part of the roof that's a lot wetter than another part, and maybe you haven't designed for that. So you have to understand work with the designers to say, are we, are we plumbing that out to a drain? Are we going to really use that water on the roof? Are we going to distribute it through a manifold? You know, how are we going to deal with uh, heating and air conditioning water? Because otherwise it just gets to be a little uh, island of weeds. Now drainage can be a problem. Here's one that wasn't quite properly designed for drainage and had a big storm and blew out the whole part of the green roof media down. So it was just, people thought, well, we'll just drain it with media. We won't, we won't put any drains in on a flat roof, and then they get a, a hard storm, and you get something like that. That's pretty unusual. But um, um, in areas where there's frost, like where you know we get about 20, 25 below C where I am, so things heave out of the ground. Uh, and so here's a drain that heaved up to the, to the top, so now it's not working anymore. You have to look out for things like that. Plants and drains. Um, you can see here is a, this is about a 20-year-old green roof in Germany, um, where the plants have just pretty much almost covered the drain. So these are regular maintenance details just to to keep the um, keep the water flowing to the drains. And then I went to uh, down to North Carolina. I got a call that these plants weren't doing well on a hospital roof, and I went and found that they had never cut the membrane in the drain. So I took, I popped the drain thing off, and they, it wasn't a horticultural problem. But this is what I'm saying. You could come there for horticultural reasons, but you have to understand the green roof enough to know. And I said, something's not right. That I said, how long has it been since it rained? They said, oh, four or five days. And, and I just went, it was standing water everywhere. And I popped that off and took a pen knife uh, from someone else, because you can't travel with pen knives in the US on an airplane. But um, so I cut that, and you could hear the whole roof go <laughs> just like that. In slow motion, that was <laughs> And so that, that really solved the plant problem. But if I just had only the horticultural knowledge, I wouldn't have been able to, uh, I probably had, would have had better billing, but I wouldn't have solved the problem. <laughs> so here's a more, uh, the proper way to do drains is, is really to box them out. Um, that's a very nice drain detail there where there's uh, gravel around it that's single sieve that allows water to move quickly to the drain out of the media, it's moving at a different speed, especially in areas where you get freezing. You can break that um, hydraulic conductivity there and have uh, covers on the drains. In my climate where we get, um, a couple years ago, we got three meters of snow, so you need, it, you need it to drain through the top of the drain as well. Uh, or if you get sheet flow, it's nice to have the, the top be perforated. Um, I'll go quickly through kind of flashings and penetrations. So you, if you're doing maintenance, sometimes you come after uh, some less than uh, quality work. You have to be able to look and say, is, is this something I should be tackling? Uh, should I be trimming these, you know, this uh, uh, felt around? But then if you just go along with, uh, with a razor knife, you may be cutting through some waterproofing. So you need to kind of know, well, where are my boundaries? Should I be talking to the facilities people, the owner, the roofer, you know, how to, how to escalate this problem to a solvable level or, or you know, so this, it's all, but you know, if you, once you take it over as a maintenance person or a facilities director, then you're inheriting this stuff. So uh, it's always good to kind of come in and photograph before you do the bid. Um, this is a hot air exhaust. Um, so 
we found out very quickly that nothing was going to grow around that anyhow. So just, you know, use stone and um, have it be a little, a little nicer. But it was just going to be dead plants all the time because uh, it was a. Uh, I think there was a dry cleaner under there, some sort of laundry. So it was just right in a hotel. It was running all the time. Now this is, uh, a, to me, a very instructional slide, because here you have a pine seedling growing past the gravel ballast and right up against the flashing. And, um, and if you pull this tree, you may pull apart the waterproofing at the perimeter of the building. So this is a question of, do I pull this or not? How do I treat this? And I would, I would take something like this and go back to the roofer and say, here's this thing, this is, there's a tree seedling at the perimeter of the building. How do you want to handle this? And um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't tackle that just from a horticultural perspective because you don't know where. It probably is not causing a leak, but pulling it might pull up a whole bunch of stuff. So you have to really understand uh, about something like that. Or just hang a Christmas bulb on it, I guess, this time of year. Um, now, irrigation is something that I know you're going to be dealing with in the Mediterranean climates. Um, so uh, the question is, how do you want to design it? Do you want to sub-irrigate or surface irrigate or use gray water to irrigate and all these, all these things? But I think irrigation requires some regular inspection to make sure it's operating, uh, and especially if you're running uh, non-potable water sources through, the emitters may get... Um, you know, may need to be checked and things like that. So this is about three and a half acres of native roof in Illinois. Um, and I went up there, they give regular tours, but they only tour this one little part of the roof. And I asked the, their um, marketing person if I could walk the whole roof, and she is, no one's ever asked to do that before. So um, up in the northwest corner, three acres in, there was a wind scour. And here's the whole irrigation manifold and, and, the, and the lines exposed to sunlight, exposed, and this, this is in Illinois. I mean, it's, it's blowing really hard in the winter. So the, the roof was just about perfect for 2.9 acres, and that one little spot was going to be a problem. So she was really thankful that, that I said, you know, you need to have your facilities people walk all through this and just look for these areas, because it's not, it's not even a difficult thing to fix at this point. Uh, but if that starts flapping up in the wind, then that's more of a problem. Uh, the same thing if things get eroded and exposed. Some of these uh, irrigation lines are not UV protected, so they're just going to de you know, degrade faster or expose to sunlight. It's cheerful talk, huh? <laughs> uh, we do a lot of winterization, so here's, here's a big project. This was uh, 10,000 square meters of green roof, and they just um, didn't winterize, so it all blew apart. Um, so it's just kind of not a, a great, the, the irrigation company was an agriculture. They, they just came in like they were going to do soybeans or something. So uh, we actually just changed the plant palette and eliminated the irrigation. So, um, And then coming in after um, repairs and things. So here's a, uh, they had to repair these motors on the building and they just had to add another motor, and they just peeled up the green roof and insulation and set it aside and said, we're done. So now whose job is it to, to put that back together? You know, the contractor's gone, probably been paid. So, you know, these are the kind of things that if, you, if you're maintaining a roof, whether you're a facilities director or a maintenance person, it's nice to be informed when repairs and, and upgrades are happening. So you can be there and say, wait a minute, you know, you need to fix this the way it was. And here's just a, a little kink pipe. Uh, I know in the uh, city of Portland, when they were doing some early stormwater data, they had a, a pop-up sprinkler break. And they were, getting, they were getting rainfall every Tuesday at 2 PM. And they couldn't figure out why. Because this one, you know, all the water was squirting up this one thing. So they had like six months of research that was kind of negated by uh, some, some irrigation problems. So it's good to, good to have regular inspections. <laughs> Uh, then we'll move up to the green roof media and plant layer. These, these are, um, if you see these, see these guys in your neighborhood, you may want to get them to the skin cancer treatment. But this is a big uh, project in Switzerland. It's about, um, uh, what was this, 30,000 square meters. So this is being blown up. It's a very peaceful job. Um, they enjoy their work. 
But the things to watch out for are um, that, that if people want to put up 100% organic media, it will shrink. It's biologically active. Um, people using just field soils, there's, um, there's horticultural problems with that in most cases. I mean, you have to watch the specifying part of that. So if you're inheriting something, it's nice to know what you're inheriting. Um, this is a, a tool called a liptometer. So this is a, a chopstick with a 10 centimeter mark on it. And a lot of times, um, in the US at least, the contractors aren't really good at, at going from square measure to cube, cubic measure, and they miscalculate, and then they just grade to the middle. So um, um, this had about half the green roof media it should. So it's nice to go around before you take over something and say, well, I think there's going to be a problem here because you're, you know, um, two, three centimeters short of specified heights. So it's really nice just to have some way of measuring um, the, the proper, proper soil depth. So you see here's, an, here's an, uh, a roof I looked at again in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and they said, well, why aren't the plants growing? And it was because there was about two centimeters of soil on the roof, and there should have been 10. So that's, um, it's amazing that anything was growing. So that, but you know, when you, when you really look at it from a distance, it's really hard to tell um, without some sort of way of looking and, and saying, well, actually, how deep is the, is the media? And then this is, this is weeding done before planting. So these weeds came in the media. Um, so you have to watch out for uh, getting as clean a media as possible. Um, and it's, it, believe me, it's a lot cheaper to buy good sterile media than to go back and pull weeds all the time. So I think that when we think about plants, we got to ask, is the roof a garden or a machine? And that's the basic plant maintenance question to me. What are you trying to get out of this? Is it going to be really high ornamental uh, gardens? Or, or is it an ecological machine that has to operate uh, very inexpensively uh, and is performing a function? So you have this, like the Stuttgart slide. They maintain those one day a year. That's what, that's what the city of Stuttgart will allow in a budget. But if it's a garden, you might want to be there two, two times a week. Um, so I think, um, Jeremy, this one's for you. Um, so this is kind of one of the ways I want to think about green roof plants is that what kind of plants are up there and how, how are they existing in nature? So do you, do you have plants that, that have come, that are biologically uh, adapted to come in after a disturbance? So they're early colonizers and annuals. Um, and then do you have plants that are stress tolerators? Like the, a lot of the Stuttgart roofs are using plants that are stress tolerators. So they can, um, they can really deal with long periods of drought, with low nutrition, low water. Or you're going to put up highly competitive plants. It's another way of keeping maintenance down. How are you, how are you thinking about that? Plants that really occupy some space and then really hold on to it. So if you look at this, you'll, you'll see um, uh, the Library of Congress job later, I'll show you how we use, kind of used all three. So this is the, the project. Um, uh, you'll, you'll hear more about this later, so I won't go into this too much. But what we thought here, this, I think for those of you here last night we were talking, this is a $150 million building with $30,000 a year for landscape maintenance. So we had all this money, and we could have made, we could have designed in a very fancy uh, roof garden, but we knew that the, the end client would have very little, a 42-acre site um, to do all their landscape maintenance. The roof would probably be the last thing they thought about in terms of landscape dollars. So we decided to use highly competitive plants, but we needed some, some early plants to really occupy some space. So we used some, some rapidly self-sowing, uh, short-lived perennials, and, and then, we, then it kind of evolved to a succulent community. So that was kind of our stress tolerators, and so they occupied space, and then they, they kept the evaporation down on the roof. And then the roof ultimately became kind of this short grass prairie with highly competitive plants. So it's really interesting, I think, as we're moving through into kind of more interesting designs to really be interesting for me as a plant person to think about building successional green roofs for really long-term, low-maintenance, high-function 
Uh, and you might, you might have to say to your client, well, this plant that you liked year two may not be there year seven, and that plant at year seven may not be there year 15, but we'll make sure that there's, that, you know, that this is an occupy, you know, has a high function. So, uh, so if you look at this from a dollar and cents point of view, this is uh, uh, my friend Cassian Schmidt, who runs a garden in, in southern Germany. And like a good German, he measures everything. So he measures every plant in his garden at euros per square meter per year. Uh, and so here you see his, his uh, dry, this is his, his um, stress, stress loving plant. And so he's measuring, um, is it hours? No, it's minutes, I'm sorry. He's even more anal than I thought. So it's, it's minutes per square meter per year. So um, he's measuring this one plant and how many minutes he spends on that. And he has this trial garden in southern Germany. And what he's really moved to is helping cities in Germany with street planting that is really low maintenance and doesn't cost the city and gives a high, kind of high value away from these really, really high maintenance um, gardens. So you see over five years, He's down to three and a half minutes per square meter per year for these Achilleas and Salvias um, that, are, that take. But he's saying on the side that in order to keep that dollar figure low, I'm not going to irrigate, I'm not going to disturb the soil and allow annuals in, I'm not going to fertilize, and I might even mulch with a mineral mulch. So if you start looking at your different plant selections like this and saying, you know, well, I, this plant is really good at stress, then, then make the green roof a stressful environment. Design it intentionally. And you can see how his maintenance drops every year. Now, if he were to add irrigation and fertility, guess what happens to those minutes per year? It's going to go up because there's a, probably a seed, seed bank of weeds in there that are now going to say, oh, okay, it's time for me to germinate and grow. So you have to, you have to pick plant communities fairly intentionally, I think, with this... Uh, um, and I think um, I wouldn't have the energy to do these spreadsheets, but Cassian's doing it, and I think that's, we'll thank him for that. Um, so if you look at some of this, so here's a, here's a green roof designed for, um, for open, open soil. This is in Colorado, and these are all Colorado wildflowers. So this was planted in open, freely draining media. Uh, to really sell this high-end housing development, these $4 million homes up in the mountains that were second or third homes outside Durango. And once they got the, all the houses sold, this is the entrance there, so they just let it go. Well, guess what? It becomes a grassland. So because it's not a disturbed landscape anymore. It's not, it's not an open, freely draining gravel landscape. So it becomes a grassland in Colorado. That's what it becomes. Um, and... Um, but they still have the barbed wire fence entrance that's nice. So that's good. And the same thing if um, this is in Texas, and this is at a Starbucks in Texas, and it's uh, all native plants, and the new owner took over the Starbucks and said, oh, I'm not going to irrigate that roof anymore. So the owner changed, and the, and the, um, so the, the maintenance protocol changed, and it became mostly a dead roof. So the, the, the design intent that was good in the beginning and good Texas natives, it couldn't survive the, the change in ownership. So the maintenance person somehow has to be in there advocating or, or going in there and saying, well, okay, now we need a puntias or now we need, we need something else now because the, the water's been shut off, as will happen in Texas. Um, and then there's seasonality. I think one of the things um, I heard in China, that we want the roof to be green all the time. And I was like, well, you know, you're near Mongolia. It's probably not going to be green all the time. It's going to be, it's going to have winter dormancy no matter what. I mean, I, you know, so you have this, this is my, uh, my barn roof at the farm. And this is a winter and then spring and then summer and then fall. So it gets this seasonality and we spend, um, I don't have the, my German spreadsheet, but we probably spend about 40 hours a year on the roof and it's about 200 square meters. All we're really doing is putting up highly competitive plants and then weeding the little borders and pulling out 
some grass species that come in. It's not, once it's established, it's not a tremendous amount of work, but I think it gives fairly high value aesthetically. And um, we have a number of landscape architects and architects that come to the farm and go, oh, I don't want those boring sedum roofs, I want one of these. So. <laughs> And then um, some of Dusty Gedge's work in London where they're really using different aggregates and, um, and materials to encourage different insects. And so if you're maintaining something like this, then you're really inside some sort of modernist painting, keeping all the lines straight. Um, so there's, there's wood in there and there's different kinds of gravel and, and green roof aggregates and different kind of plantings. Um, and this had, this is a, I think a law firm or a, some sort of professional office. They really enjoy the roof, but someone's got to be making sure that things don't jump over the lines uh, or the wood may eventually start rotting and things, so the wood might have to be replaced. But it's, it's, a, it's a high value for the client, and so they have to kind of pay accordingly there. And, it's, and they like seeing all the insects come around. So I think um, just out of my uh, botanical dictionaries, uh, um, in order to fight weeds and things, you really have to know what's their strategy? How are, they, how are they moving? When are they flowering? And you can really save yourself a lot of labor if you get to a weed before they get to you. So they've, they've, before they've put out runners or massive amounts of seeds, or they have a certain time of year where they want to move, or they, they dislike this. And so all, those, all that understanding of weeds, I probably have to learn more about weeds to be successful in horticulture than I did about plants, because you, you're going to fight those all the time. And then I think this is just the, your best management practices. Um, and one of the most common mistakes I see on green roofs is people pulling plants. They go, oh my god, there's, there's weed seed up there. And then they go up with a... a uh, a nursery crate, there's holes in the bottom, and they fill that with the weeds and they walk around like a flower sifter. And so I would generally say that you, you weed from your least infested to most infested. So the last thing you do on the roof is get to your most infested part, and then that goes right, you know, should go into a secure container and then right off the roof. And then if you're going to multiple roofs in the same day, that you're washing your trowels and your shoes and emptying the cuffs of your pants and those kind of things, uh, that you're not just distributing weeds from one roof to another. So the other thing I would encourage that is that you photograph your weeds and understand what they are. This is something I do. I try to do botanical surveys on roofs and just know what's up there and then how to attack it. Uh, and so I'll just... And, and look, there's some very good weed um, literature out there. Some universities have done a tremendous job on cataloging weeds and then how, what their reproductive strategies are. So, um, so what, this is just something to do because I'm geeky with the camera and plants. But if I can't, I, if I don't know what it is, I can bring it back and figure out what it is, and I can email these to universities and and really get to understand. Okay, maybe you know. And maybe, you know, maybe what I think is a weed, I email and they go, oh my God, that's the larval source for this endangered thing, and so don't pull it, you know? So you just, you know, you don't know what you're gonna find. And the other thing is to understand seedlings. Um, so every one of these seedlings is a plant that was specified, but how, how would you know that unless you understand the full life cycle of the plants that you're specifying? So all those, um, you know, it'd be easy to say, oh my God, you know, let's, let's just torch that and get rid of it. And then understanding the evolution of roofs. And this is a, about a 15-year-old roof in, um, in Germany. And so all the light green stuff that may look weedy is all Allium shonoprasum. It just only lives in the shadow of that, uh, that little doorway there. So you can watch the, the sun track around the building, and that's exactly where the Alliums are. And the rest of it is all Sedum album and Sedum sexangular and Sedum spurium. So you might look at that and say, oh my goodness, there's this big weed patch, but it just, the plants move over time and find out where they want to be. Yeah, and there's the, it's nice to see McDonald's in Germany, that's good. It's a, and then the, the other thing is just to, to look at a roof and say, you know, this is really, um, really a nice looking roof, I don't need to do anything, but in fact, it's full of poplar seedlings. So there's a, to really understand 
what's up there when you're looking across an expanse to really get out and poke around and see, uh, see what's there. And then when you're getting tree seedlings out to get the whole, a lot of them snap and then regrow and sucker. So, um, so it's kind of like being a doctor up there. So you need to know when you have injury or, or problems with plants, like how am I doing my diagnostics to build that expertise um, and you see, you go up on a roof that's been really nice and it looks like this. Well, what went on? You know, it's like the forensics show. You know, it'll be Green Roof Forensics Australia, I think. <laughs> and once you get to certain points, sometimes, then you got to take more drastic measures. So here's um, uh, a school in Washington, and uh, it pretty much... Uh, didn't work, and uh, we got to the point where they said you can you can weed for seven years, or you can strip off the green roof media and start over. And they, since the Obama kids go to school there, they stripped the media off and went over. Um, and then I think you really have to understand why are you watering and how are you watering, um, and you know are you hand watering, are you automated watering, are you just watering for establishment? What what's going on, uh, and then adjust your and, and, you know, if you have expertise with your water, then you're going to see you can back it off and, and add it to really uh, help you a lot with maintenance. So here's just a really wet roof that was overwatered. It was just on a computer, and then it rains all the time, and now all the plants just got soggy and didn't do so well. So you can just, a lot of times with that mineral mulch, it doesn't look that wet, so you just got to dig down a little bit and see. That's completely sodden. Just turn the irrigation off for a while. And then fertility is a, is a real double-edged sword on roofs, of course, because you have areas, uh, certainly in the U.S., we have areas with very sensitive uh, streams. So you have, do you want to fertilize for your plants? And then you have uh, high levels of phosphorus and nitrogen leaving the roof. There's a whole you know, movement to grow vegetables on roofs, and then you're going to have to have more fertility for that or in places like Auckland where they have zinc coming off the roof. You know, how are you managing all these things? The, the roof is connected to a storm drain and connected to a river or a stream. So fertility has to be, you have to kind of have this ecological perspective. Um, and, and places have very high acid rain. Uh, other places have really a lot of, uh, of high pH in the soil. So all that stuff has got to be figured out. And here is a, uh, a really old roof, a 25-year-old roof that's just out of nitrogen. So, but it's, you know, so it's not, it's not bare, it's performing a function, but it's very mossy. So if you don't want mosses, you know, raise the level of nitrogen and you'll start. I saw a little patch on this roof of hairy vetch that had come up, and there was this completely different little ecosystem where the vetch had fixed nitrogen in the soil there. Uh, and then the other thing is timing with, if, if people are doing work on the building, um, generally I would say always put the green roof in last because the glazers came in after this and just trashed the roof. Or people come back and put skylights in. Um, so again, coordinate with kind of the timing of all this work. And, um, and then little, this is a guy who's actually killing a native plant with uh, Roundup, so he's in disguise. Can't, his identity can't be known. Um, but sometimes you have to manage things at a micro level and just um, just really use some selective measures like this. And um, um, this is on a, you know, well, I won't say where it is because he, I know you'll put out the hit squad on him. So, And we found mowing on a roof uh, in our climate worked really well because we get these really hot, humid summers and sometimes the plant will get really proliferous, and then it'll fall over, and then we'll get uh, bacterial and fungal problems. And so we just we mow this one little stripe, and it keeps it very fresh and nice. This is a, what I'd call, this is about a five- or six-year-old green roof going into winter, really nicely maintained. Uh, gravel perimeter is looking good. Uh, the succulent area is looking good. The grass is cut back. I mean, this is this is a putting to bed for winter. This is a nice looking piece of maintenance. And they'll come into spring with very little work. So if you get these kind of um, stable systems, you can get surprises. So this is, um, uh, after 25 years in Germany, they're getting orchids. 
So they've, they have figured out this, this very low, I think about eight centimeter depth. So they, and so they get this, uh, what they call this arrested pioneer species. So they, nothing else can come. And then they just get a little more. And then after about 20 years, they got this flush of orchids that came in. So it was kind of, kind of cool. So sometimes you get, you know, they, they planned it very well. Um, so they didn't do a lot of maintenance, and that allowed all this orchid seed to get established. And so uh, I thought that was kind of nice. And you know, just um, I end up end up with just some shots I've taken on green roofs that are just really f fun surprises. So this is not woodpecker habitat, but it's nice that uh, it's not a searing hot uh, piece of asphalt for the little baby to land on and get fed. Um, I think. Um, those are those are fun surprises, and this this is in Maryland a honeybee on a nice native Talinum calicinum collecting nectar, and I don't know what this thing is, but it scares me every time. <laughs> so, um, but there there are a lot of uh, amazing um, nectar sources, and you'll get you just the more you look, the more amazing stuff you'll see, and uh, moths and wasps. And then you start to get predators. So that's kind of cool to see the predators move in. Um, and some bigger wildlife, the chicks, uh, the killdeer chicks hatching out. They, they seem to be on a lot of green roofs around where we are. And because uh, the, their predators haven't figured out how to get to the roof. There's no, no opposing thumbs. <laughs> and there's some, uh, I'll just uh, be shill my, my books and Nigel's books. Um, uh, we've put a good bit of work into these. So they're not perfect, but uh, they're, I think, a good starting point. And um, that's my contact information. I'm always happy to uh, uh, respond to emails in the digital world. So I appreciate the, uh, the time this morning. Take care.